Your ears do not deceive you. You have just entered the Cryptid Creator Corner brought to you by your friends at Comic Book Yeti. So without further ado, let's get on to the interview. Hey Yeti, what's shaking? Yeah, I did see that Megaton was crowdfunding on Kickstarter now. I love that book. I was a backer for the single issues myself. That whole creative team is great. I love Fernando Pinto's artwork, and it reminds me so much of hanging out with my friends in middle school and playing Nintendo, well, minus the giant mutant bugs from outer space swooping in and trying to take over part. Wait, you can make a transformation sound? Who knew? Yeah, that power gauntlet is cool. Whatever Derek touches can transform him into an alien annihilating mech. Even a hot dog cart, too. Too funny. Where can people go to back it? They can head on over to Kickstarter and search for Mechaton, M-E-C-H-A-T-O-N, or just check the show notes. I'll make it easy for them. It runs all of February, and it's awesome that everything is done and looks like a really quick turnaround for backers. And that exclusive Jason Muir cover is awesome. He's doing Spider-Man stuff now. Did you just really say foo yo? You gotta get off TikTok, man. This is Byron O'Neill, your host for today's episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner. Today I'm joined by comics creator Matt Harding, who is now dying, I'm sure, to get to talk about his new Batman related story dropping in the Batman, the Brave and the Bold. Story is called Nameless. Matt, how's it going? Hello. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well, man. I'm I'm sure you're you're doing better than me, though. I mean, getting to write a Batman story is pretty spectacular. So, it is a dream come true for sure. Well, judging from your mm-hmm. Twitter X, I'm always going to keep calling it Twitter. Um, post the other day, this feels like a dream come true for you, and and you know, getting to hold that comp in your hands. I, did that? Is that the thing that finally made it real for you? Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, of course, there's like different stages of like feeling super excited about it but that was the one where i could actually like talk about it you know yeah um because it's been it's been in the works for like a year like i got i got the job like a year ago and um i was i finished writing it last april and the hardest part about this whole thing has been uh not being able to really talk about it yeah because i mean it you know it's a huge deal for someone who's been reading comics his entire life you know so it it uh events so when i eventually got to to talk about it and when the comps came like it had like a kelly jones cover in here and there's a one of my favorite artists of all time is christian ward there's a christian ward cover oh wow and it's just okay. like yeah i'll show you give it better for one of the stories yeah. in there and um so so when i got a when i actually opened that box and i didn't even know that's what it was going to be yeah it was it was a, a really good moment like you know life a, like a lifetime moment for me yeah, yeah, I'd imagine. I mean, it's got to be amazing. You you had people like Dan Waters and Gail Simone kind of chiming in online with their support. And and I love seeing that. You know, comics is really an amazing little community. And like lately, I think I think there's been just a lot of depression, you know, like uh with everybody. So it's really really cool to see somebody from the indie comics community being uplifted in such a positive way. I was surprised. Yeah, like uh People who who I've never, I mean, like Gail, I've I've had a couple exchanges with because I I took her for like kind of class thing that she did, um, like a writing kind of tutorial stuff she was doing at the beginning of the pandem- uh, pandemic. I took I did like a little story for that, right? That, and that story is actually a bit, is the one that just got published in the in this one. Okay. So so I talked with her a little bit, but yeah, but like seeing like the response that people had uh, was super cool. Like I, I did not expect it, and it was it was uh it, very welcoming and and kind, and yeah, it, it it was it was a good thing to see. Well, the that Kelly Jones uh, cover that you were just showing that you know the variant cover, oh, yeah. um, that was my trigger, right? Because everyone has a, that first Batman experience where the that iconic character grabs a hold of you, and and no matter what, it's it just rests in your comics DNA from then on. You know, for myself, I grew up like more of as a Marvel kid because that just happened to be what they had at the local gas station racks that was within like bicycle distance from my house. And then when I got older, you know, those early 90s Legends of the Dark Knight st- stories were just hugely formative for me. Prey and 
Grant Morrison's Gothic, and then 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 there was Kelly Jones with you know Batman Dracula. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's that it's hard for me to ever. I'll always compare every other artist who works on Batman with Kelly Jones. So that's so cool that you got you got a Kelly Jones cover for yours. What was your Batman moment? Uh, so yeah, so um, for me, so when I was when I was a kid, it was kind of the same thing. Like I would go to like a Seven Eleven or something like that, and they'd have a lot of Marvel, you know. Yeah. So so Batman was more already kind of like a uh, uh, kind of like a like a, a legendary like a myth- mythological figure already, right? He he was more like everywhere else, but like the comics were adult. Like when I was a kid, like they were, you know, like, Oh, Batman just killed somebody. Like, I forget what exact issue that was, but it was where he's hanging that guy upside down and he like burns in the, fu- he burns in the fire and that whole yeah, thing. Yeah. And, you know, and so like, uh, the comics themselves were like, Oh man, like look what Batman's doing. Right. But like, I, I got raised on like the animated series and like the, the movie, um, you know, uh, uh, Batman forever was like the first one that I had seen. Um, and so he was already kind of like in, in all other areas of uh, of entertainment for me, um, not just the comics. And I think the first like comic comics that I that I remember getting really into uh, was was uh, like with when Bane breaks his back, you know, like, yeah. like that that area that era of it. Yeah, and uh, you know, and, and Night's Fall, and then the um, you know the the crazy like. Uh, what's his name? John Paul uh, Valley was that his name. John Paul Valley, the the um, you know, or Azrael Batman. You know, yeah, yeah, it sounds right. I think I wasn't his... a, wasn't as big into the Azrael arcs personally, but yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, he was. Um, I think, I think my the first one that I really really liked, the first huge massive like Batman run was the one where uh, where Gotham uh, gets hit with that with that earthquake, and it's uh, you know, they uh, with No Man's Land. That's what it was called. Um, that was my first like one where I had to buy like every single issue, you know, and I was like going to the local comic store, you know, for the first time, uh, with my dad would bring me there and we'd get all the, like the nights, you know, the, the, the no man's land uh, issues, you know, yeah. that, that was where I really started getting into DC comics was that, that, that time period, you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think my favorite Batman, I could talk about this a lot. I'm sorry. You stop me. No, if I'm being no, too- they'll ramble. It's all good. Uh, my here. my my favorite Batman uh, was Grant Morrison, uh, okay. and it, and it was in JLA. I, I really liked the, his run in the JLA. Um, you know, like when the aliens show up, the White Martians pretending to be you know superheroes, and and Batman does that thing where he's like the last one left, and he uh, he has a little circle of fire, and he cracks his knuckles, you know, and he's like, you know, like who's first or something. I forget. I think that's what he says. Like who's first. And that was where I was like, oh yeah, Batman's cool, you know. He's like he's like Clint Eastwood or something, you know, like uh, when 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 Clint Eastwood was cool. But um yeah, that that was like that was like my that was like my Batman era, I think. My favorite okay. Batman era. So, you know, to me what really defines the Batman universe are, are the Rogues Gallery, the villains, right? So, did you do you have a favorite villain? Yeah, I do. Um Scarecrow and Mr. Freeze are usually the two that I go to uh, the most. I'm not I'm not so much a Joker guy. I really like um, uh, a Man Bat a lot. Yeah. Also, uh, that's I was that's why I was really happy to see that the cover of, with with a uh, with Man Bat on it. Um, this one, because yeah, he's because uh, the first story in here is like a Man Bat story, and uh, I have a fond a fondness for Man Bat. I think it's because it it was that first um episode of the animated series you know the okay. where where he was in it so i i, I have a fondness for him i mean the, the rose gallery is so good um mr freeze i like a lot and scarecrow i like a lot i i think that the whole like uh you know getting hit with the fear toxin and and all the hallucinations is always like fun stories you know yeah yeah i'm a huge killer croc fan that's that's oh I'm yeah doing. how about you what's your favorite rendition of killer croc um, I actually, there was a, um, recently there was a, more of a kid's book and I'm, I'm going to space and forget the title. Um, but it was, it was definitely written for younger readers. It was like killer croc is killer crocs, but my best friend or, or something like that, that came out really recently. And I absolutely loved it because it was just a very, very different lens on the character. You know, it, it brought some softness to, to him. Um, and really, really enjoyed that. Um. 
of course, you know, the stuff in the Suicide Squad is great, but he's gotten a little bit overshadowed because the, I guess his range, you know, his abilities and stuff kind of got taken by King Shark. So, mm. I mean, because they're, they're just like very similar in, in that regard. So, you know, he's had a little bit less prominence there. But yeah, yeah, always been a really big Killer Croc fan. Well, he, uh, did you read the Catwoman um uh, the old lady Catwoman. I forget what I forget the actual name of it, but it was one of the uh, um, Black Label. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was he was really good in that one. Where he was kind of like an older kind of like he had like the hat, you know, and and uh, was like an older kind of gangster guy. I I, I like that rendition of him too. Yeah, it was really interesting. Recently, I don't know if you saw the the reptilian line. Oh, uh, the Liam Sharp one. Yeah, yeah. That was really I like Liam took that. I'm so impressed with what what Liam has done because he's, you know, it would be very easy to, to maintain his artistic style that he's done for 30 years, but you know, he's, he's really pushing it. He's gone in a completely different direction um, with more of that, that painted style than, than he used to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it was re- like hit or miss, um, you know, cause that one, I would, I, it came off a little dark to me, just kind of overall, just like the shadow details were so deep that I had a little bit of trouble um just like visually staying in it but i mean kudos to anybody who is kind of pushing it and and not happy with just staying where they're at and trying to change it up and do something new so so liam um i worked with liam for eight years i i was oh. at uh i worked at made fire uh, which is like a motion comics company that he started um and so like i i'm good friends with liam and i saw his process for making that first off let me say liam's one of the best one of the kindest people and uh that you'll meet in comics like he's he is yeah. an amazing person he's such a nice dude i got a chance to interview him a while back so yeah he's great and he showed me his process for doing that comic and it and it was <laughs> in liam fashion he he kind of was like oh it's easy you know like I, this is a this is this easy thing i do but he'll take like he has all these textures you know yeah. and he'll take a texture and he'll put it up and he'll he'll start etching out the scene in the in this texture like he'll do he'll paint it digitally and he'll actually pull little shapes and stuff out of this texture that he has and he'll all of a sudden have like a batman with the city behind it and stuff like that so he he worked very like differently for that you know yeah um it, one of the things that impresses me about liam is that he's always changing his process like he's like a genius of processes right yeah and and for each comic he does he has like a whole different process you know like when he was doing green lantern it was very uh, he had all these like weird technical stuff that he would do that he would play with like things in Photoshop that I didn't even know you could do in Photoshop, but he, he would do like, you know, selections and, and it would like outline things in certain ways and do all this like crazy stuff. So you can make all these like little circles everywhere for like space and stuff and, yeah. and, uh, very like technical, like, you know, software driven methods. And, but he did that just for the green lantern, you know, and then he'd come over to that one, like reptilian. And he'd be pulling out all these shapes from textures and work from a page just like that, you know, like he'd be pulling the panels out of it. Right. So it'd be like 11 by 70. I could, I could talk about his process because it's super fascinating for forever, but he'd have like an 11 by 17 page of just texture and he'd be pulling the panels out of that, you know? Yeah. And, and I, and I would, and I'd ask him like, how are you doing this? Like he was showing me how he did it. And I was like, how do you, how are you even doing this? Like, this is insane. Like that your mind can, can work like this, but, He's like, oh, it's easy, mate. You know, like it, it, it you know, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> he's, he's a genius. That guy doesn't get enough. He does not get enough credit for, for how good of an artist he actually is. Like he is a massive genius. Yeah. hundred percent. I think people tend to, to like associate it with like the death's head, you know, as more of that, that that's the Liam, that's iconic Liam, you know? Yeah. Um, but he he's been able to to change it up so much. I mean, I got into the XO Man of War run recently just just because he's on it. Oh yeah, yeah. He's uh, that that series is good too. Yeah, man, Liam. Uh, so if you never saw his motion comic stuff, that was like Liam, like full throttle, like artistic madness. Like he he was doing things because because that you could have it was like motion comics where you could have things moving around and you know like fading in and out and stuff and so he the way he was telling stories and that was just crazy what time period was that like 
So that was Made Fire went out of business three years ago, and okay. it was in business for about 10 years. So what would that be? Like 20, 2010 to 2020? Well, it was like 2011 to 2021. I think it was like the time period. The thing that sucks is you can't find any of that stuff anymore because since they went out of business, um, the website went down and everything is gone, right? But you might be able to find like YouTube, like uh, commercials and stuff like that, um, which are, I think are still all up, you know, but um, okay. yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Not Unfortunately, not something you can pick up off of eBay. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish. I, I mean, it's still out there somewhere, you know. Yeah, um, well, everything is in some corner of the Internet. Well. Every writer hopes someday to get a chance to make their mark on, you know, the the mythology of an iconic character like Batman. So tell me how this all came about. How did how did the opportunity originally become knocking at your door? So uh, I, uh, you know, speaking of Madefire, I had worked with um, uh, Ben Abernathy, who is the executive editor over at, at DC um, for for the Batman series. And because after Madefire, he went to that um, and he's done a great job over there. And they've been doing this series, uh, Brave and the Bold. And they were looking for stories that kind of, um, that they would slot in, you know, like, uh, to, to fill, you know, areas, you know, like if somebody, you know, didn't turn a story in on time or something like that, they could slot something in. Okay. And, um, he had been seeing a lot of the stuff that I had been doing. I had been writing a lot of short stories. So like, uh, you know, in different like anthologies, um, and, uh, there was one that I did for uh, it's called Lower Your Sights. It was a um, for the Ukraine. It was for like a benefit for children who were who were um, who lost their homes in, in in the Ukraine. And I'm I'm part Ukrainian, so like I really wanted to be a part of that. Yeah, and I had done a story with uh, Justin Greenwood. Uh, he drew it, and um, Ben had seen that and a couple of the other stories I had been doing, and he he gave me the chance to do to to do this one. And um, they had it scheduled originally to come out, I think, in July of this year. Okay. But I think I think a story was late or something. So they wanted to move it up into this issue. So I found out about a month before it was coming out that it was going to be it was going to be coming out early, which was which was cool. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the Brave and the Bold has gone through so many iterations since it started in 1955. And, you know, kind of as an anthology format, how restricted were you with respect to characters and how, how much did you have to pay attention to continuum and all those things? Um, so yeah, that's, so that part was, was a little bit, a little bit wild actually. So, uh, because I was given, I was given a prompt and then it ended up being, uh, cause Amanda Waller had put out like this call to, to, um, uh, for anybody to, that kills a hero, like they'll get like a reward or something like that. Like it was, it was part of the, this new, like the new era or whatever they're calling the, you know, yeah. the, um, and, but I think that was kind of quickly, uh, forgotten about almost or not, not necessarily forgotten, but like they kind of diverted from that storyline. Um, cause so I think she ended up doing some other stuff instead, but that was like a part of it. And so like that, it was like a thing where, Oh, you have to come up with an assassin to that's going to want to kill one of the heroes. Right. Okay, and so, gotcha. and, and then, so I said, okay, so, uh, what assassins are open? And, um, I was told that, Actually, we don't really know, uh, you know, who, you know, who who's not being used right now. And I was like, well, that's cool. I'll just, what if I just came up with, like, I'll just make a new one or something, you know? And I saw the opportunity, of course, to to, to make a new character. And I was like, yeah, I'll just make a new character. Nice. And they're like, okay. And then then I was like, all right, so, you know, who who what character should I use? Can I use uh, Batman? Can I use Nightwing? Can I use this? And then, you know, uh, they're like, oh, well, Nightwing's off doing this thing. Uh, Batman's already in three of the stories. Um, you know, like uh, uh, Robin's doing something else. So, why don't you do? Why don't you use the signal? You know, and I was like, yeah. okay, you know, and and I I knew a little bit about the signal, like because I I read Snyder's run and and all that, and um, and I thought he was cool, but I didn't know the extent of, you know, like what what all his character can do. Okay. So like I, I started researching the signal, and dang, that that the signal's crazy, like. He has, um, he's like a god, like a godlike powers. Like he, I don't know how much, how much you know about him, but like he, he basically, I mean, he could see the future. He could see the past. He could travel through shadows. He could turn invisible. 
he could wield shadows. Um, he can absorb all the light. He can travel between multiverses. And he can actually like look through to see what's happening in another multiverse. He's okay. like, he's oh, he's immortal. Uh, don't want to forget that one. He's also immortal. And so I, I started reading his his like bios and stuff and, and doing some research on him. And I was like, how am I going to write a story about a guy killing this guy? Like this guy is in right. I mean, he's it's like an A-list or powers, right? Yeah. Yeah. He, he's yeah. like the, um, he's almost like, like a, like, you know, a, a beyonder level character. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, so, you know, I went in and did some research. So I saw how other writers like kind of handled that and stuff like that. And I think a lot of them, a lot of what happens with him is is he doesn't have full control of those powers yet or doesn't understand them well. Some people don't even write him like he has any powers, you know, which yeah. is interesting. So I think he's kind of like getting the hang of how to use those powers in most of the stories he's in. Um, the one the the one iteration of him that is like all powerful is that one from DC Metal where he's got like that axe and he's like going around uh, with like that crazy like gothic Batman costume and, and stuff. Um, but of course, you know, the signal that I'm doing is that one right there. Um, like the regular, you know, yellow costume. And so he, he does a couple things like he turns invisible and stuff like that. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm getting off on a huge tangent, but the, he brought up the signal and, um, the signal actually, uh, kind of perfectly fit the villain I had come up with. Okay. You know, like they had a, they had a relatable, uh, background kind of like they had a relatable um, you know, uh, subject matter, you know, and, and, and I think it, it actually worked out really well more so than any other of the other Batman characters, I think. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a really interesting approach because, you know, after getting a chance to read it, um, softening a character like that, I, I always love it when that's done so well, you know, and, and I thought this was done really, really well. Um, yeah, it, it's always challenging. Like, so you've got, legacies like this so as a writer what was your approach to kind of putting this together was it so you got you created this other character you know here's the okay here's the bad guy you have the signal running around okay there's there and then you have x number of pages right to work with and and did they give you a certain number too to kind of start off with yeah um i was given the the 12 uh pages and okay. um and uh, you know, uh, as far as like re restriction, I think I think one of the things that uh, got me the job was as I had done a lot of short stories. Like I think I I had sent because Ben had asked me, "Hey, send me your short stories," and I sent him like ten of them. You know, like that I had, I had yeah. done uh, recently because I, I had been doing a lot of like anthologies and stuff like that. Um, and at first, it was really hard to to write a short story. You know, like it's you don't have much space, um, but. I kind of like got into the rhythm of it after a while. Like the, the, the one I did with Justin was only three or four pages. Um, and I, and I, and I was able to start like understanding how to, how to cover a lot of ground fast, you know, like what, what do you do to get readers engaged in this story? Um, for this one, the dog actually was kind of a, there's, there's a dog in this for anybody. Who's listening? Yeah. But there, uh, the thank dog you. By the way, kinda... I love dogs. Oh yeah, well yeah, that's the thing. Everybody, everybody loves, loves dogs. dogs. Yeah. Uh, so like, how do you get somebody emotionally invested in a character without having to do like an entire chapter? You know, is is you give them you give them a pet, you give you put an animal in there. Yeah. And all you have to do is see a dog's face, and you're like, something better not happen to that dog. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. And then you tell the people something's going to happen to this dog, and, and <laughs> they're they're in and it. They're you in. Know what I mean. Yeah. Um. So. So yeah, like I, I learned kind of quickly how to cover like a lot of ground, you know? Yeah. Um and so twelve pages, you know, like sure, like if, if I had another, you know, five or six, I could have, you know, expanded on it more. But um I, I think we, we did a pretty good job uh telling the story in just those twelve, you know? Yeah, yeah. I love that eight to twelve space for me as as somebody who's just really gotten into trying to write scripts and stuff. 8 to 12 feels really nice. Yeah, I've interviewed a lot of people lately who have graphic novels, right? It's like 300 pages and they've invested three and a half years. So I'm like, ah, no, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. no. no, I'd lose my mind. 
Well, for me, it would be so hard too to kind of overcome that desire to leave a footprint, you know, if you will, you know, mm-hmm. so as opposed to just trying to tell the story, you know, so is it, is it, was it overwhelming? Right. Cause for me, I'd be like, okay, I just don't want to fuck this up. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, uh, for me, thankfully my editor, uh, Alex Gaylor, um, who, after that story, he actually was because he was like a freelancer for DC at the time, um, and he was assigned it by uh, by uh, by Ben, and um, uh, he he's he's now in collected editions, and he actually does a lot of writing for DC. Uh, he he had a story in the um, this newest uh, Valentine's Day, the Guy Gardner, uh, how to lose a Guy Gardner in ten days. Yeah, he had a, a Constantine story in that, and then he had a a robot man story in the Halloween issue. And he's a, a fantastic writer. And, um, and he was my editor and he was, he is a very, he was a very, very good editor on this project. He, he helped run ideas by me. Uh, he helped me do some research. He, he helped, he treated me like I was like, like I was Alan Moore or something, right? Like I expected, I expected to, to kind of like have a hard time getting a hold of the editor. Cause I imagine they had, a ton of more projects that they're all working on and stuff like that. But he was very responsive. He he got on calls with me and he, he was so into the project that I never actually had a really, like I never had a hard time thinking this wasn't going to be good, you know, because he was so excited that um, I didn't have any of those like normal, like self doubt things happening, you know, like sure. he was able to really kind of combat that with how, how kind and how uh, energetic he was about, about this story. And, uh, that, that helped, that helped a lot. Um, I mean, overall working for DC was, it wasn't just a dream come true. Like they, they treated me really well. Like I got paid before I was even done writing the story. Like it was immediate, you know? Oh, wow. Um, Which is very, I mean that, you know, in in the world of freelance, that's very, very rare, you know? Very rare. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in everybody I've, I've talked to there has, has been very, very kind. There's never been a, a sense of like, oh, this guy is small potatoes, you know, like there, yeah. there was never any of that. Um, which I get, which I get all the time working at, um, doing freelance for other smaller pub- publishers, you know? Yeah. You know, they, they just, you know, I mean, that's just kind of like a thing, you know, like they, they treat you kind of like, you know, you're, oh, you're a newcomer, you know, you're not as important, but DC, who's this, the biggest of the big, uh, didn't treat me like that at all. Um, which is really, really comforting, you know, like, so as far as that goes, like my nerves, um, we'll talk, you know, talk, I'll talk to you next Tuesday when, <laughs> when the story comes out, but, uh, uh, so far I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, yeah. I think it's, I think it's going to go well. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, let's take a quick break. What in the Sam Hill is happening right now? What is that? Yeah, what eagle? You like bards? Yeah, what eagle? Oh, you like band of bards? It's not my fault, you mumble. Oh, that makes sense. They're dropping some great new series right now. There's that one about a heavy metal guitarist in the 1970s with monsters, working class wizards. You know how we love monsters around here. And my friend Dakota Brown, he's working on a project, uh, Grandma Tilly's Hell Tech Mech with Lane Lloyd. I saw the preview for that. That is crazy. Jimmy even contributed to their anthology from the static and had Matt Sumo on the podcast to talk about his project, The Bardic Verses, which makes a lot of sense that the project landed there. Yeah, where you are, boy. Where can you find them? You need to get out more. They are in previews, or you can visit their website, bandabars.com, for all the latest. Can we turn the music off now? <laughs> Thank you. No more surprises, minstrels, or anything like that, or I'll rent you out to the Ren Fair as a children's ride. <laughs> Let's get back to the show. For me, after reading through it, you know, the, the story is nameless. Um, I enjoyed the statement of it. Um, at least that, you know, for me, this is what I got out of it. And I, nameless you know i think we all feel that way sometimes you know in the the social media area with um all these parasocial connection you know whereas as we get these glimpses into other people's lives and how good their lives look and how we want to be a part of their life because that's so cool you know um you start to feel connected to them but the reality is maybe not so much 
Um, yeah. So w- what were you trying to tap into? Uh, you know, the, the funny thing about that is that, you know how people say, write what you know and all that? Yeah. Um, I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. Like it was a weird, it was a weird thing. Cause I didn't realize that's what I was doing. And then, and then after the story was done, I was like, wait a second. Like I, th- I was tapping into, you know, kind of like that feeling. Right. Because I I've been, I've been working in comics. I made my first, like actually went and made a comic. Uh, I've been doing it since I was kids. I was a kid, but like I made a comic and brought it to a convention for the first time when I was like 21 or something. So a while ago. Um, and uh and then i've been working behind the scenes a lot and i've always been doing self you know self publishing and and doing like covers or you know like a short story drawn drawing a short story here and there and you know and, and little things here and there and and, and kind of getting work that way but never never in like the big arena you know yep um and i had kind of like given up on it to be honest like i was like yeah you know it's it's never going to happen right like i'm not going to get that call um, and I was, and I was fine with it because I love, I love indie comics and, and, uh, you know, like that, that, you know, that, that dream was, was something that I, I you know, I was like, you know, it's, it's just probably, it's just probably not going to happen. Um, and then it did. And, uh, it, it, I realized kind of like the story that I decided to do with that was about a guy who had been working behind the scenes, you know, for a long time, never, never getting a chance to be in the, in the big arena. And I was like, oh, dang, this, it, this is like, it correlates, you know, of course he's goes about you know dealing with those feelings in a very evil way um uh or somewhat evil at least um and and so there's a lot of you know those feelings in that character uh and in signal you know and 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 i saw those those same feelings in signal also and so that's why it really works it i think the two of them together you know signal handled it in a healthy way you know and Mm -hmm. then uh, nameless handled it in a very unhealthy way and it, it just kind of worked out, you know? Yeah. Well, you're not just a writer. You just mentioned, you know, doing covers and, and other stuff as well. So is there is there a freedom kind of in remaining unattached to both ends of this project? Were you glad, okay, I don't actually have to draw this too? Uh, yeah. Um, so so the cool thing about, about doing, you know, I, I know some people who do both, you know, uh, kind of like me. Yeah. And, um, I think, I think some, sometimes like when, when an artist in a, is a writer also, they have a hard time letting go of control of the art. Uh, but for me, it actually was the exact opposite. Like it was, it was a thing where like, I was like, oh, you know, this artist is so much better than I am. Um, I think if I was, if I had to draw it, my, my self doubt and my, my uh what do you call it uh, imposter syndrome would be just going crazy right gotcha uh, yeah. i'd be i'd have a hard time i'd be happy have a really hard time doing doing the artwork for like a, a big two story like i just it it would be um so much anxiety um but but mike was such a good uh artist that he so like i because i envisioned you know certain scenes and stuff of this and he when he turned the roughs in he nailed it. Like he just nailed it. And uh, I had like no notes. I mean, I think maybe one tiny minor note, but I mean, it was, it was amazing. Like he just, he just did it, you know? Yeah. And, and as soon as I saw those ropes, I was like, Oh wow, this is a, you know, this is a real thing. This is going to be a, this is going to be a real thing, you know? And, um, and then the colors came in and it was just, it was just a, it was a really fun experience. Yeah. Visually the pacing is really nice of it for, you know, like a tight, shorter story sure yeah 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 i i mean yeah i i couldn't it's so they did they were the team that did nail biter back in the day and uh uh they just man I, I couldn't be happier with it honestly i really couldn't and uh I'm, I'm really excited to see what people what people say well hey the door's open right so let's say you get to write any dc character in like a five arc series so who you choose and why? Uh, so I have, Sentinel is fine if you want to go with the Sentinel. You know, you've got you've got the background. Now. <laughs> um, so I actually already have I have a pitch that I put together. It, it'll probably never happen, but it's like my dream pitch, and uh, it's for Kyle Rayner, uh, the Green Lantern, um, that nobody cares about anymore. But um, 
he he was he was my Green Lantern when I was a kid. You know, like he was. Uh, I, I I didn't care about Green Lantern at all until Hal Jordan went nuts and Kyle Rayner got the ring. Yeah, that was kind of like my time of of reading comics, and so I have a whole pitch that I that I developed. Um, that you know, if I one day get a chance to make it, uh, it would be awesome. And I'll even tell you what it is. You know, like it's. Uh, <laughs> I I, I kind of thought. Um, so Kyle Rayner was a big deal until all the Green Lanterns came back, right? Yeah. And he kind of dropped out of, you know, uh, popularity then because nobody, I feel like nobody really knew what to do with him at that point. Um, because he's not, he's not a cop. He's not a soldier. You know, he's like an artist who was given a ring on a, on a, on a lark, you know, like just because he happened to be in the alleyway. Yeah. And uh, he really just doesn't have a place in that type of, uh, the type of like organization, you know, like he's not a, he's not a soldier. It'd be like, if you gave me, Oh, Hey Matt, you know, you're, you're being drafted into this war, you know, like get out there, you know, like that's not going to work for me. Like I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a killer, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a soldier, you know, like I'm, I'm a, a an artist and a writer, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I suppose like I, I might be able to like hold my own if I absolutely had to, but like Kyle does not belong there. Like I would not belong there, you know? And, and so I feel like that's why his character, the, and I apologize, this is another thing I could talk about for like an hour, but I, I, okay, I think okay. uh, his character kind of just doesn't fit. So like my, my pitch for him would be that he would be honorably discharged, right? Like his partners and stuff would be, would be kind of like, you know, we can't really work with this guy, you know, like we love him. He saved the core, you know, whatever, you know, like he's, he's an absolute hero, but he's not, you know, he's not a soldier. He's not a cop, you know, like he's, He's too empathic, you know, like he's he's always, you know, um, siding with the people who were arresting and stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, he doesn't really have a place here. So he I'd ha- I wanted him to get not fired, but like, you know, honorably discharged. Go be a go be an artist, dude. You know, go do what you're going to do with your life. You know, like you don't have to be a Green Lantern, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in, in that happening, he kind of the ship he's on going <clears throat> going back home. Um, gets you know like hijacked you know and all this stuff and he ends up kind of joining this group of people who are all uh uh either you know like exiles or, or like rebels against you know their their core you know like the so there's like the red lanterns and stuff like that so like i wanted to put gun uh in there and the freeze and like a couple like you know random ones i made up who are all kind of like um uh people who used to be like a red lantern or yeah orange lantern or this and that and they, for whatever reason, have turned against against their group, you know. Yeah. And then the that group of people are kind of like a Guardians of the Galaxy type thing, where they're going through space and doing stuff, you know. Yeah, and yeah, that, that sounds cool. Yeah, and that that was my it was like a found family kind of thing, and that and that was my my idea for for Kyle, you know, because I I figured, you know, like DC doesn't really have like a Guardians of the Galaxy really so much, you know, like uh, you know, ragtag group of of you know, space people, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's the people that they do have, man, would that be a weird crew? Cause you got to throw Lobo in there. You got to have Lobo in there. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. So that would be my dream. That'd be my dream five issue series. Yeah. I've always wanted to write a, a Papa Midnight. Um, like oh yeah. Short series like that. And you know, that basically looking at change you know as we change as we age as the catalyst of of everything else that happens in the world kind of you know forces us to change so drop him like essentially have a a shooting um that happens you know with with a young black team in like new orleans and so this kind of pulls him into actually ended up saving some kids as as there's like a riot thing going on and that that's sort of the catalyst for for him starting to change and like evaluate who he is and all that. That'd kind be of stuff. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Well, we all got our little like pet things we'd love to do. Right. Yeah. And, and Papa Midnight, I don't, you know, he hasn't had a series or anything, right? That'd no, be a good Papa. one. That'd be a really yeah. good one. Yeah. He, well, he's one of those little bitty dark corners of the, the DC universe that really just hasn't been explored. And I think people just, I don't know why he hasn't really so much, you know, been touched that He's always been a favorite of mine. I liked him in the movie too. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the Constantine movie, and I know that you know there's like a divided 
a Constantine audience on that, but like I, I really like the Keanu Reeves movie. Yeah, uh, that he was in. Um, in Papa Midnight, and that was fun. Uh, but I forget Anshu was the actor. Uh, yeah, I, for, uh, I was about to say I forget the the guy's name, but yeah, he yeah I think that's who it was. Yeah, I mean, I I enjoyed it. I mean, I'm not going to call it a cinematic masterpiece, but I, I, you know, I liked it. Whatever, it was fine. You know, hey, for the haters, it's coming back, so they got to deal with it. Apparently, yeah. The the devil in that I think was kind of made oh, that movie. That so good, so mm-hmm. good. Yeah, yeah. And it was uh, Tilda Swinton was in that as well, right? Yeah, she was the uh, the big bad, and then uh, the devil was almost like an ally, kind of yeah. like by accident it was uh what's that guy's name peter uh peter something you you know who i'm talking about the yeah yeah he had the tar coming off his feet and stuff oh it was so good that yeah that that imagery right there was to me what i felt like made him as a character and then just really made the movie because that was creepy and it was such a simple effect mm-hmm. but it was so well done it was just amazing yeah i think that that scene alone is kind of what made that that Constantine so uh, memorable for me is is that scene, you know, like just that scene with him and the devil is, is so was so good. Yeah, well, and I love the pool. The pool the pools are always like just such an interesting thing to use as a vehicle for narration in in any movie. I don't know why they like. I just get sucked into pools as a as as a metaphor, as you know, a visual element. Pools are cool. There's just so yeah. much you can do with it. You know, with a mirror and and everything. Yeah, it, it, that movie. I mean, I know it was. It wasn't. You know, it wasn't Constantine as Constantine is in the comic. Of course, it was a very different uh, uh, rendition of him. But like, I don't know. Like, I I I really liked it. You know, like I know he wasn't like wisecracking, and he wasn't you know the the Constantine that we all all know and love. But um, I think it was a good. I think it was a good rendition. You know. Yeah, I don't think Keanu could have pulled off that no. type character. It's just not, yeah, it's not within his range. He he tried to do the British accent, right? Uh, in Dracula, was it? Was it, I think he was trying to do that accent, and he just couldn't. He just couldn't do it. <laughs> well, thank God that had like Gary Oldman to, to sort yeah. of carry that movie. Because yeah, now that one, I'm. I mean, I'm a I'm a I'm a fan, but I'm a reluctant fan of that movie because it was just beautiful, but. He he was kind of forgettable. It's not one of yeah. Keanu's best roles, but who knows? Maybe he'll bring something uh, more to it in the next uh, the next movie. Because I think they are doing another one, right? As what, far as I know, Dracula or Constantine? Uh, oh, uh, Constantine. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's another Constantine. I'm I'm happy to see him in another Constantine. Just please, not in another Dracula. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, how? I mean, anything that Gary Oldman's in, uh, he's stealing the show. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Well, I've gotten away from asking this late, Vita. I think it's a really appropriate for this, um, kind of an inspiring moment for listeners as you know, we have a lot of regulars who are trying to make it in the indie comic scene. So you certainly reached uh, you know, a personal milestone with, with getting to write in the Batman universe with Brave and the Bold. So what advice do you have for somebody like out there struggling, right? Because there has been a lot of that. And maybe negativity isn't the right word, but like depressive like certainly is, you know, so sure. looking, looking for a pick me up for them. You know, people need to hear some positive vibes. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, how like good of a pick me up this is because it's probably not the answer like that a lot of people, you know, necessarily want, but um, the truth of it is, is that no matter if you just stick with it, uh, it might be, you know, three years, it might be five years, it might be 10 years, it might be 20 years, but if you just stick with it, and you stay a fan and you stay involved and you stay, uh, you always, you know, you're always trying to get better and you're always learning and you don't concern yourself too much with like the money aspect of it or any of that. Um, you're going to eventually, you're going to get opportunities eventually. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, my, my journey has been that I have, I mean, I, I threw everything at the wall, you know, like I, I, uh, I took out loans and went to school to get become a better artist. And I, you know, I, I taught myself skills uh, that I needed for, for jobs that, that I would get the job and then they would start on like, like for made fire. I didn't really know too much about motion graphics, but they wanted to hire somebody and I taught myself 
how to use their their software over the weekend, you know. Oh well. Wow. Um, and you know, and 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 a lot of people say, you know, you know, stick with one thing, you know, and and they're right, you know, like you want to get really good at one thing, um, but you also you you just want to you want to take every opportunity you can get. Don't don't burn yourself out, of course, but um, just continue making stuff, continue writing, you know, do short stories, you know, do you know, uh, small gigs, you know, um, and don't give up. I mean, that's really all, really all it comes down to is don't give up, you know, don't ever, you know, like I, I see a lot of people will burn out in a year or two, you know, because they'll come in and they'll try to, you know, they'll make a lot of really cool stuff and then, then they'll get really frustrated and they'll get really downtrodden and they'll get hit with, you know, some hard, you know, critiques or some hard, um, you know, like, uh, rejections you know yeah um and you just can't let yourself you know get down you know like i i've gotten hard hard critiques from people you know people who are really respected um and you just can't let it you just can't let it beat you you just got to keep making stuff and keep making comics and keep loving comics keep going to conventions keep talking to people keep being keep being a fan um and and you'll you'll make it, you know. Like you will get that opportunity if you if you sit in a chair long enough, you're going to get a haircut, right? And sure. uh, you know, for 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 Batman, um, that's kind of what it was, you know. Like, not only was I friends with Ben, but I was reading a lot of like DC comics, and I was always geeking out about it to him and talking about how cool like Batman is at the time because he was doing a lot of cool stuff as the as the executive editor, and um, just being really into it, you know. And and eventually that you know, you'll get, you'll get let in, you know, you'll get, you'll get an opportunity. Yeah. Just don't quit. You know, persistence pays. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which, you know, you know, I mean, you're doing it right now, you know, you're, you're, you're interviewing people, you know, for, for comics, you're, you, you love comics. And, oh, I did. And, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the background it saved my life. Like actually, you know, I'm oh, yeah. people, I can genuinely say that um, because I had, you know, 2020 and people who listen all the time, probably like, Oh God, he's going to tell the story again. But you know, like in, in 2020, I had this big autoimmune flare, like, and put me down, couldn't walk, you know, got down to 130 pounds. Um, oh, man. and like my body was just wrecked. Like it's, it's taken years to just re-strengthen to say just like parts of so atrophied, it just wouldn't work. Um, but through all that, you know, comics was something that I could go to at the end of the day that would take me out of my body that felt like it was completely failing me, you know? Um, and so that got me through it, you know, having a story to take me someplace else for a little while, you know, every single day was, was, was really key for me. So that's why I, I say that's it. awesome. I saved, saved my life. So. Well, I mean, that, uh, it's not awesome that you had to go through that, of course, but it's it's awesome yeah. that yeah, you had you had the outlet of comics to help help get you through that, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know started. I did the the baby steps. Started with Kickstarters, right? You know, do it do it in the written interviews, and you know, then it it just kind of came up to this, and this has been you know this amazing opportunity because I don't get the the opportunity to travel as much. I just don't travel well these days, but you know, I get to meet people and I get to talk about stuff that I love. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and and, uh, and I mean that is everything, right? Yep. The fact that you're doing this is everything, right? Because you are meeting everybody, you're getting a chance to to become a fan of, of of people's work and stuff, and and get acquainted, and that's that's really everything, you know. Like that's that's how you do it, you know, yeah. and uh, that's great, you know. And I and I I do not, I would not be surprised if you get you know a chance to write Sentinel, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like one day, you know, just keep at it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, I've got, I've got lots of things in my head. It's like, a, you know, as I'm sure as, as you do, it's a, it's a matter of, okay, what do I focus on? What do I push? And, you know, I really, cause I have a background more as, as a, a 2d artist, you know, um, coloring is the thing that I'm, I'm really, really interested in, but it's, it's just a matter of finding time with life and a, a teen. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm giving the spiel that everybody does. It's an excuse, but you know, um, but you are doing it. You're not using it as an excuse. You're doing it right now. Like you're you're part of the community. You know, you're doing yeah. you're you're part of it, right? Like that's the thing, is like you you I think a lot of people uh they they come in and they they kinda like try to uh 
to do like their magnum opus, you know, right off the bat. And they burn themselves out because they have other responsibilities and stuff. But like, if you just pick at it and you, and you keep being, you know, you keep being involved and do everything you can do, like you're gonna, you're, you know, you're gonna do it, you know, like you're, it really is a matter of just sticking with it. I mean, it really is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that's not what people want to hear though. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't come in thinking, oh yeah, you know, in five years, this, this is what I'm going to be doing as a career exclusively, you know, like I'm, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be a comic book artist within, you know, two or three years, you know, like I think the I think the average that they're saying is eight years is as long as it takes to actually start to get to do it as a living. Um, but, but you just can't, you can't be like, Oh, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to do this. You, you really do got to do it, uh, because you love it, you know? Yeah. Which is one thing I like about comics. Like, I know it sucks that like, you know, none of us are millionaires or whatever, but I think, I think that if people were coming into comics and doing it just to be rich, it would kind of destroy the, the art of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do think people should get, you know, paid, paid well, but yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, you, you, yeah, you you know what I mean. You know, like, and and I think a lot of people also they feel like, oh, I'm not a writer, I'm not a I'm not an artist because I have a day job. You know, yeah. but that that's another thing that I think people have to stop looking at. Like, even if I am, you know, because I work at, at Oni as in design and production, that doesn't mean I'm not a comic book writer. Like, I introduce myself as a as a writer and artist. You know, yeah, that is you know what I do. And you know, a lot of you you could be a writer and artist and still work at a grocery store. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't mean you're a grocer, you know, that's just something you have to do while you're, while you're doing your, your comics, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like so many people that I've met in this industry and, and it, it's a unique industry that, I mean, I, I can definitively say having come from the entertainment business and working in 2d art and how cutthroat things are comics is, is way different. Like this community will like open their arms and say, let me help you out. If you're not a dick, I guess there's that <laughs> yeah. caveat, right? Um, but it is it is really really unique in, in that way. Um, but it, I feel like there there's just a lot of people who who deal with that imposter syndrome. You know, that's mm-hmm. not that's not me. That's not my problem. It never has been. Um, but yeah, um, it it is hard for somebody who's also spectrum like myself to, um, and who comes off as a lot of times it's like maybe overconfident even. And it's just like, no, you just, you just do the thing. And, you know, I've sort of always been that way, but even with, with the lupus and battling that it is that the increments that you've been talking about, they, that that's my life, you know, because I have good days and I have bad days and you just have to have to ride it. And, you know, going from that, coming from that place where you couldn't walk, you know, there's no way that I, I was going to walk within a week. Right. Like it, it, it was a, dedication every single day setting aside the time towards this goal you know of like okay i've got to get to this place and i didn't know how long it would take and i'm still at it you know every single day you know trying to work on that um so i appreciate you know what you were saying for people and and just you know that that piece of information you know stick with it persistence and and unfortunately time i guess yeah uh first of all let me say that um it's it's incredibly commendable, you know, the battle, you know, that you in your attitude about it, you know, like for what you've had to go through. Like I can't even imagine like how difficult that that must have been and is, you know. Yeah. Um that's amazing, you know. You you have a really upbeat, you know, attitude about having to 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 to, to do that. And I, I think that's that's amazing. And that is also kind of like how you have to be, you know, with with comics too. You know, like it, it there's a there's a you know a a, a uh, what do you call it a um connecting idea there you know you know what i mean right yep and in in comics i think also they go through hard times there's like a you know there's a cycle it's been this way it's been this way since the 30s you know since you know superhero comics started especially in, in comics in general just blew up is there's a cycle you know there's down a down yep. you know and an in and up and i think we're in the down right now um but I think I think it'll pick back up soon, you know, in a year within this next year or the year after it'll blow up again. Um, yeah, I think so. Everybody's wanting to it to be the the 90s again and the sales number. Like we're I don't know that we're ever going to reach that. Like, no, by volume, like by volume, if you look at everything that's out there, that's a different 
lens, right? But I think just like an individual book sales number, I don't, I don't think we're ever going to those numbers again. Yeah, I, I think, I think, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on it, but I do think that the '90s kind of made it. Um, what the '90s did is it, it, it kind of was like, hey, guess what, everybody, you can make comics, you know? Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it kind of made it, it made it a a broader spectrum than just Marvel and DC, like. And I know there was like indie comics, of course, before that, uh, definitely. But I don't think it was like as accessible to people. Yeah. Um, but that story of what those of what those creators did, I think, really blew it up amongst amongst everybody. And and yeah, it's going to be hard to make those numbers again. I, I mean, there will be there will be you know books like The Walking Dead and Saga and stuff like that that kind of hit hit uh, you know peak popularity. You know, mm-hmm. I think there'll be another one of those. Um, and that that'll kind of you know balloon the industry up again, but it yeah the nineties I don't think in general can't happen again I don't think I don't I just don't think it will yeah yeah me neither well I know you work at Oni and uh, there was that big uh, announcement the other day about EC and I guess I guess I would call it a rebirth of sorts so yeah so yeah what's going on with that so um, there was a uh, Oni you know has a deal with uh, with the owners of of uh, of, of EC I'm not exactly of the specifics of it because that's all above my pay grade but um sure but i do know that like it's a it's generally something that everybody who's involved is super excited about um when when they brought that to us uh when our bosses brought it to the team um they actually had a historian come in and uh kind of like do this whole like hour-long presentation of like everything you see is done you know like uh the people who owned it and you know kind of like the directions they pushed it in and it's actually pretty amazing, like the effect that I knew a little bit about EC, you know, and, 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 uh, Mad Magazine and all that stuff. And, uh, um, just how like pivotal EC was to, to not just, not just comics, but just, you know, the, the entertainment industry and the, the country in general. Um, and it, it really opened it up to being like, there's superhero comics and then there's like here is comics like here is like horror and and uh and um you know sci-fi and humor and and and, and this and that and and there's there's tons of stuff that like came from that like saturday night live and, and all this like crazy stuff that you wouldn't really you know think was affected by ec but it was you know like ev- like everything like walking dead and and just every like all these people um were all like influenced by ec comics and like the the horror comics and stuff that you would find and in and, and of course they were also wildly successful um they they really you know put art first you know so like they would have like you know art that was like very different and very uh you know well done by like you know top paid illustrators and stuff and it was just it was just super influential and uh within the company at oni We've known about it for about a, like, you know, maybe about a year. Um, our new publisher, Hunter, um, he's he was like one of the first things he started to get together. But then, you know, it was just kind of like whispers of it. And then when it finally, they're like, hey, look, here's the covers, you know, um, that Lee, uh, 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 how do you say his name? Berrimo? Berrimo? Okay, yeah. Berm- you know what I'm talking about? Bermejo? Bermejo. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I I'm horrible with names. Uh, oh, it's all, so am I. I'm, I was taking a stab there. Hopefully, I got. Yeah, no, I think you got it. Yeah, I think you got okay. it. Um, yeah, uh, that he he did with like the two people. One's got the axe, and there's the people hiding under the bed and stuff. Yes. Like they showed that to us, and and we were of course like blown away. And um, yeah, I mean, the creator list we have on it is is uh, stunning. You know, yeah, uh, with with even more people joining up. You know, all the time. And and so yeah, we're we're very excited about it, and it was a huge uh, reception to to that announcement yesterday. Everybody was really, you know, going crazy over it. You know, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I and mean, is there a is there a designed pocket, if you will? Like, are are we going to try to emulate what, to some extent, what e- the EC of the past? You know, with the horror, with the sci fi, and yeah. So I think the general idea is, is so like we have uh, two titles that were announced already, which was the Epitaphs of the Abyss and uh, Cruel Universe. And those are new titles, um, but they are going to be like the short story, you know, horror and sci-fi horror kind of thing. Okay. Um, 
And and I think that I, I mean we're definitely trying to you know like continue the legacy of EC and do it do it correctly. We don't want any of it to be like you know um, to, to feel cheap or you know or, or you know uh, what derivative you gim- yeah derivative or gimmicky or you know like we don't want that. We want we like one of the reasons he brought in uh, that Hunter brought in that uh, his friend who was like doing the the, the history presentation is I think. The, the general idea is that we want to co- continue the legacy of it. You know, like we actually want to continue the importance of it. You know, it, yeah. it's not, it's not just a, uh, it's not just a like, Oh yeah. You know, we're going to put slap this name on it. And, you know, because it's got the EC name on it, you know, people will buy it. And then it's, it's like a gimmick, right? Like we actually, yeah. he, he wanted to Hunter. Hunter has been a very, very good um, publisher. He's been, he's been here for, a little over a year um, at Oni. And there's, of course, the, you know, the huge, you know, uh, kind of like uh, shuffle, I guess, or, you know, like yeah. I, I came after there was all the layoffs and stuff like that and things. Like that okay. kind of, um, so I, I came right before Hunter and um, uh, he, but when he came in, like, man, he changed things. And one of the things he did was, was, is this EC thing. And, Hunter loves comics. You know, he, he loves the history of comics. And one of the things that I really like about working for him is that he is taking this, uh, this line and he is making sure that we, you know, enrich in the, the brand of EC. Like we, we, we want it, we want it to be the legacy. We want it to be, you know, like important, you know? Yeah. And yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah. I mean, so to, I guess to put it to, Simply is like, yeah, we want it to be the best thing it could be. You know, we want it to mean something to comics. Yeah. Like it used to. Well, but speaking of like used to, um, it's more used to, but gold key, right? You you personally yeah. have this like Boris Karloff thing that's coming out with gold key. Cause that, I mean, that's yeah. a, yet another old publisher that is, hey, we're back. Yeah. Yeah. So here's, here's this. This came out uh, last week. This is issue number two. And I have a story in it. And these, these characters are actually, these characters are actually the characters from the story. Um, and uh, this is following issue one. You can get this as a standalone, though, because it's got the stories in it are kind of like standalone stories. It's it's almost like a presents kind of thing, you know, like a okay. like a Crypt Keeper kind of sure. situation. Um, but they from what I understand is that uh, there's some some guys in Southern California who bought the 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 gold key license and they're kind of reviving it, you know. Yeah. And th- this is actually we had to work with uh, the Karloff estate. So. The stories in here are owned by his family, um, which is pretty cool, you know. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, and so I think that's going to be a continuing thing. Um, I think they're going to do three issues and then put it out as a trade, also. Okay. okay. Um, but they're you know as long as it's selling, they're they're going to keep going. And this this issue apparently massively outsold the first one, so they're um, you know they're it's becoming more popular. Yeah, yeah, they have a Kickstarter going now, right? Too like some cool yeah. thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, with the um, what's his face, uh, Jay Stevens. Uh, yeah, that actually looks really cool. I I like what Jay does. He did a book. Let's see if I have a handy. He did a book with us too, uh, called Dwellings. That yeah. was super fun. Yep. I have I have a hardback of it around here somewhere. Um, but yeah, that he's man, he's he's a creator. He's he's a creator to watch. You know, like he's he's fun. Yeah, that's definitely on my list to pick up. It looked really neat. Yeah. Cool. Well, what else you got uh, kicking for 2024 that you can talk about, of course? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm still kind of building it out a little bit. I got some variant covers and stuff that I'm doing for, for a couple companies. I have another short story that's going to be uh, in a Kickstarter. Uh, okay. Next month, I think it's going to run. And uh, there's an artist named uh, Nick Cagnetti who who did Pink Lemonade. Oh, I talked to uh, Nick. Yeah, Nick's great. Yeah, yeah, and he's yeah. he's drawing it, and I'm super excited about that one. Um, so I'll let I'll I'll put like a I'll send you a message or something for when it's on Kickstarter. So if you wanted to like tweet it out or whatever. Yeah. But um, cool. other than that, I'm open. You know, I'm open for work. I want I want to generate more more stuff. You know, uh, I think I'm pretty open going from June on. Uh, I'm doing my own self-published comics also uh, that I'm, I've been working on for about a year that I'm going to start putting up uh, on a Patreon, either a Patreon or Substack or something. I'm still trying to figure that out, but um, yeah, I mean, just, just making stuff, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I get it. Well, where can people find you online? Where would you like them to find you? Uh, Matt Harding Art. Uh, MattHardingArt.com or, you know, on Twitter, it's just Matt Harding Art or on um, Instagram, it's Matt Harding Art. Uh, you just M-A-T-T-H-A-R-D-I-N-G-A-R-T. Awesome. I'll put yeah. a link in the in the show notes and stuff so people can find you. Um, and then The Brave and the Bold is out February next week, right? Next week, next week. yeah. Awesome. That will be amazing. Yeah, we'll, we'll get the episode out so everybody can hear about it before it comes down. And um, yeah, Matt, Matt, it was so great to have you on. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. You know, best of luck with future endeavors. So exciting that, you know, you've got the Batman story out that that's living a dream. So, well, and, and keep me, uh, keep me appraised of, of what you're working on too. Uh, I want to, sure. I want to, I want to read your stuff. <laughs> I got to get on it first, but yeah, I, I'll definitely keep you in the loop. I appreciate it. Cool. Well, this is Byron O'Neill. And on behalf of us, all of us at Common Book Yeti, thanks for tuning in and we will see you next time, everybody. Take care. This is Byron O'Neill, one of your hosts of the Cryptid Creator Corner, brought to you by Comic Book Yeti. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Please rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. It lets us know how we're doing, and more importantly, how we can improve. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner, maybe you would enjoy our sister podcast, Into the Comics Cave. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.